I'm going to start with an introduction where I introduce the topic of the PhD with some applications, and then I'm going to focus on section two on the problem of early classification of time series. Then in section three and four, I'm going to tackle some limitations of this problem. So first, the, uh, the fact that decisions are irrevocable in the classical setting, and uh, then um, the fact that time series are finite length with, with only one label assigned to each time series. And finally, I will conclude with some research, some promising future research directions. So for the problem setting, let's imagine a, a situation where we have some user data acquired over time. So with the more weights, the more data we have about this specific user. And actually, our ultimate goal is to trigger some alarms as soon as possible. So the setting is as follows. So this data is given to a classifier, which actually um, estimates the posterior probability of the, of the different classes given the available data. Then we have a trigger model that decides actually either to wait for new measurements or to predict the class label of this time series. So here, for example, we want to detect as soon as possible a suspicious behavior of, uh, of a user. And actually, the contributions of my PhD thesis uh, focused on the trigger model. So the main question of the thesis is actually when to make those classifications. And actually, for the classifier part, it's, it's, a, it's more a fixed part that we, that we have actually, it's basically uh, some feature extraction done on the time series, and then we have an XG boost model uh, on top of this feature extraction, and it actually gives us a, a reasonably good performance over all the data sets that we use. And actually, the same classifiers is used for the for the whole trigger for, for the whole set of trigger models that we developed, and also from the the one you, we used from the literature. So when we make a decision. Actually, we need uh, to deal with the earliness accuracy trade-off. So if we make very early decisions, we have very few data uh, available, and the decision actually is not reliable because we have very few patterns. And on the other side, if we make very late decisions, uh, the problem is that uh, it, may, it might be too late to be useful. So actually, the core question here is how to choose a good trade-off between earliness and accuracy. So for some examples of applications, we have the, the problem of, the, of churn detection. We want to, to know when to contact potential churners. So ideally, before they decide to leave orange. For fraud detection, if we have a time series of transactions, we want to, block, we want to know when to block a bank card, before, ideally before a certain damage is made. And for, in network monitoring, we want uh, to, detail, to know when to detect a failure, so ideally, before this failure is established. And finally, in patient health monitoring, we want to know when to detect uh, uh, potential serious health problems. So ideally before the health status of the patient gets worse. So this uh, early accuracy trade-off has been dealt with in the literature of early classification of time series problem. And uh, it is actually a supervised classification problem where we have uh, a set of time series with, uh, and we have label assigned to each one of them. And actually the difference between this early classification setting and the classical time series classification problem is that at running time, we have measure, measurements acquired over time, and we need to, the goal is actually to assign a class label to this incomplete time series as soon as possible, so before a certain deadline capital T. And we know that we have no supervision on the best moment to trigger this classification. However, we, have, we assume that we have prior knowledge. The classification is irrevocable as well. Uh, so whenever we make a decision, we stop receiving a new measurements and actually the procedure is ended. So we're gonna see in section three how we can deal with the, the problem where those decisions are actually revocable. So the question becomes when to revoke those decisions. We're gonna see in section four what happens if we have time series that are labeled in portions. And we're gonna also see how to, what happens if we don't have a deadline to make a decision and we receive uh, measurements online in, a, in, the, in an indefinite way. 
So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus on the problem of early classification of time series. So as a bit of context, um, so here we are going to see an overview of the state of the art. So we have uh, four big families of approaches in this problem. The first one is MPL-based approaches, where the key idea is actually to learn a time step from which uh, the prediction about the class of the incoming time series becomes stable. So in those approaches, the user actually uh, uh, starts by uh, uh, defining a threshold on the accuracy, and we need to obtain, obtain it as soon as possible. In shapeless based approaches, we need to extract uh, subsequences of time series that are highly discriminative uh, towards a certain class, and uh, the idea is to try to, uh, to detect them as soon as possible at running time. We have also approaches optimizing explicitly the trade-off between earliness and accuracy, and the idea is actually to, uh, to trigger the alarm using the trigger model at the moment that optimizes this trade-off. And uh, there are also some recent works that cast the ECTS problem as a reinforcement learning problem where uh, actually a decision policy is learned and uh, the, the agent is interacting with the environment, which is the time series, and it tries to learn an optimal policy that uh, optimizes uh, the earliness accuracy trade-off. So we're going to focus on uh, the economy framework, which is uh, which stands for early classification um, of time series as a non-myopic decision-making problem. So this um, this framework is actually cost-sensitive, so the user uh, should give actually uh, the cost of misclassification, which is basically how, uh, what is the cost of making mistakes and the cost of delaying this in the decision, which is in an increasing function over time. So in this framework, the earliness accuracy trade-off is formalized explicitly in the decision function, and it has a unique characteristic in the literature, which is the non-myopic feature, which means that actually uh, it gives an early estimate about the triggering moment, and it also makes decisions at the current moment based on what could happen in the future. So here is the idea. So um, if we have a timestamp T, so we, here we have the in blue that our time series, so it is incomplete. And actually the big idea of the, of the algorithm is uh, to forecast the expected cost of decision, um, of the, of decision for every future time step. So it is the orange dashed curve. And actually we need to look for the minimum. So here the minimum exists in the future, which means that there's a better trade-off in the future. So our the decision of the trigger model would be uh, to delay the decision. And in the case, if uh, where the minimum actually coincides with the first point of the dashed curves, it means that there is no better better trade-off in the future, and actually the decision of the model, of the trigger model, would be to classify the incomplete time series at the moment. So how does the, the economy approach work technically? So in this approach, uh, we have um, a forecasting function that takes uh, as input uh, uh, the, the available amount of data, which is our incomplete time series XC, and it has a, a parameter tool, which, uh, which actually defines the point in the future that we want to forecast. And it actually has two terms in order to, uh, to formalize uh, this trade-off. So we have the, uh, the cost of delay uh, that are given by the user, and we have the expected cost of misclassification at this future timestamp T plus 2. So the best uh, future trigger moments would be actually the arg minimum of this function, and the triggering condition uh, is actually when the minimum actually coincides with the current moment. So if we apply actually the definition of the expectation, actually this approach is not tractable because we don't have access to P of Y XT. So actually the idea is to make this uh, solution tractable. So, but first we need actually to learn uh, a set of classifiers. So we need to build a, actually a collection of uh, truncated data sets. So it means the, the basic idea actually is at each time step, we hide the rest of the values of the time series so that we can learn uh, a classifier which is able to predict the class label of the, the complete time series given an incomplete one. So here we have a set of classifiers and we are able to predict the class label at each time step. So in order to make the solution tractable, we need to compute the expectation actually on uh, certain groups. 
So those groups actually could be, for example, a clustering on the complete time series so that we, we can um, identify groups of similar time series. And actually, you could ask the question, why do we need we're doing classification? Why do we need actually clustering? So the idea here is that the pro problem is complex and we need actually to make decisions from partially observed time series. And uh, the idea actually is uh, to try uh, to learn the, con the possible continuations of the time series, XT, as we see. And then this actually continuations helps us to learn uh, to estimate more precisely the, the rest of the terms uh, that we show in the equation. So the first term actually is a similarity model, which actually weights. Uh, so if we have our input time series, which that is very similar to, to one of the centers of those clusters, so this weight would be very high. And then we have the prior of the class within the group JK, and we have the confusion matrices of the, the class of the classifier. So here in this in this case, it's the confusion matrix of the classifier at the point in the future that we want to predict, which is the point t plus two. And then it's weighted actually um, uh, using the cost of misclassification. And we have finally the cost of delay. So in order to implement um, an approach uh, within this framework, we need to answer two questions. So the first one is how to build the data partition. The second one is how to estimate actually the probability of belonging to each of the groups that we identified during training. So the classical approach is economy K. And actually in this approach, the choice that was made is using the K-means algorithm on on the complete time series in order to identify those similar those groups of time series. And we have, a, and they use a distance-based model uh, which actually computes the distance between our input time series and the centers of the, the groups identified by the k-means algorithm. However, we need to make, in this approach, we need to make choices about the clustering algorithm and the distance-based model in order to compute the similarity. And however, what we propose in economy gamma is, uh, is an approach where we don't need this clustering to with this choice of the clustering algorithm, and we don't need this similarity model. And actually, the idea like, the, of economy gamma is to estimate actually the, uh, the distribution over groups given our input time series in future time steps. So we, we're going to use transition matrices for that. And the idea is the following. So uh, the, first, the first step is actually we need to discretize for every time step the, the output of the, the classifier. So the output of the classifier would be here the probability of belonging to the class one given our available data. So the user actually uh, uh, sets a, uh, the number of sub-intervals that we want to, to actually estimate. And then it is, uh, those intervals are of equal frequency and they are estimated for every timestamp. As we can see on the figure, they are different according to the timestamp. And then the second step is actually to learn those um, uh, transition matrices between successive uh, timestamps. And finally, for the similarity model, we can, we're going to use only the classifier at our current timestamp using the, the given data. And then uh, what we can see is that we have this gamma t vector, which indicates that our model, uh, our group at, cur at the current time step is the second, uh, second sub-interval. And then if we want to estimate the distribution over groups in future, we're going to compute, uh, the, we're going to multiply it by the transition matrices. So we're going to incorporate that in our function. And this term actually serves us as a weighting model for the rest of, of the terms. And it gives us an idea about what would be the group in future time steps. So for the experiments, we have performed uh, our experiments on a 45 data sets um, benchmark. So with data coming from uh, simulated data, read electrocardiogram data, electricity consumption, and so on. And this benchmark is publicly available. And we have a collection of classifiers which are trained on versions of the data set. So we have a classifier for each 5% of the length of the time series. And we have fixed costs 
so normally the scores are, are coming from the expert, from the domain knowledge, but we don't have them. So we fix them. We fix those costs for all the data sets with the cost of classification, uh, which is one if we make incorrect predictions and zero if it's correct. And the cost of delay is linearly increasing according to the timestamp. And we parameterize it by a parameter alpha that we vary over a large range of values. So for the evaluation criterion, we propose uh, the average cost. Um, so the average cost is actually how much on average, it costs us to it costs for the user uh, to pay for a given time series. So, for a given time series, we have the triggering model that gives us the optimal moment to trigger the classification. So, we use this triggering moment in order to uh, to compute the predicted class, and then it gives us we compare it to the, the ground truth, and we have the cost of misclassification, and then we have the cost of delay at the triggering moment uh, that we add to the cost of classification, and we average overall. Uh, the time series of the data set. So for the results, we have compared multiple variants of the, the econ economy framework, and we have found out that our proposed approach, economy gamma, actually outperforms the other methods. So what we see here is the predictive performance uh, measured by kappa versus the earliness, which is the, um, the percentage of the length of the time series used uh, on average for triggering the the classification. So on now on bottom left, we see very high delay costs. So it means that we may, we're making very early decisions. On top right, we see uh, very low delay costs, which means which means that we were waiting for more measurements to make our decision, and it explains the uh, the increasing tendency of the curves. And we see actually that our that our economy gamma is the the best one because it is the earliest, and it is not at the expense of the predictive performance. So we have also compared this approach economy gamma versus a uh, uh, competitive uh, approach of the state of the art um, uh, called SR, which is stop in rule, which stands for stop in rule on 45 public data sets. And we have done uh, statistical tests on a large range of uh, values of, of the delay cost. And we see that we outperform this, uh, uh, this approach. So now I'm, I'm going to tackle the, the first limitation of this um, classical setting, which is the early classification of time series. So now here we're going to see what happens if uh, decisions actually are revocable. So the setting is as, as follows. So we still have our incomplete time series uh, at timestamp t. And this is time series is given to that classifier. And which estimate the posterior probability distribution over classes and it is given to a trigger model, which decides either to receive a new measurement or predict the class label of the time series. However, what's different here is after predicting this class, we still receive new measurements. And um, maybe actually after receiving new patterns, we're going to think that uh, our last decision that we have taken was wrong. So it's the same situation actually when a physician uh, revises now what's in the misdiagnosis. And in order to tackle this problem, we're going to introduce a cost of changing a decision or the cost of revocation, which actually has the same format and the same units as the cost of misclassification. And it basically means that how much it costs you to uh, how much it costs you to, to change your decision. And actually, for example, we, if we think about uh, an application in the medical domain, if we make very early decisions about on the measurements of a, um, of a patient in a hospital, and we want to detect as soon as possible if we give him treatment A or treatment B. So let's say that we have an early decision on treatment A, and we, we still actually receive new measurements, which are in this case could be medical results. And uh, we think actually that our last decision uh, was wrong and we should give him the other treatment. So here the cost of changing decision is, for example, the side effects of the first treatment because it has side effects for, for basically nothing. Or if we think about another application, um, if we also monitor a certain patient in a hospital and we want to decide, decide if he needs to undergo um, operation. So we make the early decision that yes, he needs a, a surgical operation, and then after the full, after having the full knowledge, the full medical results, 
we want to revoke this decision because we think that it was wrong. So the cost of changing decision here is actually uh, the, how much it costed you to prepare the operating room. So you, you just load, and it costs you money actually, and uh, time of your medical stuff. So now how, how are we going to tackle this new setting? So uh, we're gonna actually introduce our cost of decision change in our forecasting function. So we have this forecasting function with as input the sequence of decisions of size k. So the decisions that were made so far on our given time series. And we have the, as the classical setting, the expected cost of misclassification and the cost of delay. And actually we have uh, the sum of decision changes because actually we want to prevent the model to change its decision at every time step. And we, we, have, uh, we also want actually to incorporate the non-myopic characteristic on, uh, the, on the risk of revocation. So this actually terms this term is the expected cost of changing the decision because at time t we have a current decision. We want to know, the idea here is actually we want uh, to know if our, if our current decision is very likely to change in the future. So we want to change it as soon as possible. And actually it is estimated using the same logic basically of the, of the expected cost of misclassification. And our algorithm um, actually is, consists of three conditions. So the first one is that your classifier at the current time step needs to predict a class label uh, which is different than the, the last one taken. The second one is that the current moment is actually optimal with respect to the, to the optimization criterion that I showed in the last uh, slide. And finally, the cost that we pay actually uh, by changing the decision now uh, is less than what we have paid in, uh, in the last decision. So the, the thing is that even if I had to pay an additional cost of changing the decision, and I also pay the increase in the delay cost because I waited for more measurements, I still pay, pay less than what I have paid in the last decision. And this actually only happens uh, if the expected cost of misclassification, which is the first term in the last equation, drastically decreases so that it compensates for these additional costs. For the evaluation criterion, we also have a cost-based uh, evaluation criterion. So the first one, the first ter term is the misclassification cost. And the second one is, uh, is the delay cost. So those are computed uh, using the last decision taken uh, on a given time series, xt. And we also uh, add a new term, which is the sum of decision changes that has been made. So uh, for a given time series, and this actually is a sort of regularization because we want models, we want to favor models that change, uh, that do not actually change the decision at every time step. So for, for the experimental setting, actually we use the same benchmark data set as, uh, data set as the, the classical setting of ECTS. And we have taken actually the, the prediction of the global regime economy gamma as a starting point, and we use our revocable algorithm. So this algorithm actually tries to revoke or not. It depends on the situation. Uh, the decision made by the irrevocable regime that we represent by economy gamma. So we see in the on this figure, like for example, on the x-axis we have the, the values of alpha for the delay costs. And on the y-axis, we see the, the, cost of, the values of the cost of decision change. So here we have a bunch of combinations between the two costs. And we see in this part that uh, our revocable regi regime uh, that, we, that we propose it outperforms the economy gamma in the irrevocable regime. So we have plus signs, which means that uh, we, may, we, have, we outperform it statistically significantly. And when the delay cost is very high, we have some circles, which means that there is no significant uh, difference, which and also and these are also positive results because uh, when the cost of decision change is very high, actually the best decision to make is to not revoke the decision. So we keep the exact same decision of economy gamma, and it may and it's very normal that we have uh, that we have uh, the same actually the same uh, uh, average cost or the evaluation criterion. And uh, only when the cost of decision change is very high, we have some minuses, which means that. Uh, we revoke, uh, we, we, have, we are outperformed by the irrevocable regime and 
uh, which means that we revoke decisions uh, uh, that we shouldn't actually revoke. And finally, we, um, um, an important information is that when we, when we um, compute some statistics, on the, um, actually on the samples that could, for which there is a useful revocation, there is only 3 to 8% of samples in our benchmark that needs a revocation or that uh, the revocation is useful because it improves the cost uh, paid by the user. So actually the revocable algorithm uh, identifies uh, well the, those samples and the revoke uh, the, the prediction for them, because this is why we see the pluses, and don't revoke for the other, uh, the other samples. Uh, we have also plotted the part of France for three different uh, uh, methods. So we have first the irrevocable APOFCR, which is the revocable algorithm that we propose. And we have in blue um, uh, actually just taken the economy gamma in the irrevocable regime and applied multiple times. And finally, we have the economy gamma in the irrevocable regime that makes only one decision. And we see that our approach here for a given cost of changing the decision, uh, we see that our approach uh, has a better um, predictive performance measured by Kappa. So now uh, we're going to switch uh, to the fourth section where, um, so in this section, uh, we have another limitation of the ACTS problem to tackle. So the limitation here is, is that in the classical setting uh, time series, so you see in the ACTS setting, which is the classical one, uh, actually we have a training data set of complete time series, but we have only one label associated with each one of them. So there's one label for the complete time series. And at random time, whenever we make a decision, actually once we make it, it is associated with the complete time series. So here is the here is what we, what we have seen in section two, the classical setting. So what we propose is the EcoTS setting, which is which stands for early classification in open time series. Uh, so here the difference is that in training set we have um, uh, the labeling actually is uh, is associated with portions of different lengths in the same the time series. Which is, very, which is different from the ECTS setting. And at running time, the first difference is that we have multiple classes to deal with. So we receive measurements over time, and we need to decide for actually each measurement as soon as possible what is, what is the class of this class label of this measurement. And also, we have no deadline. So this actually, this measurement take, measurement take, uh, acquiring procedure actually could take very long periods of time and there is no fixed deadline to, to make our, our classification. So uh, actually our, our main goal of this section is, how, is to propose a new methodology on how actually to adapt the ECTS approaches that are developed uh, well in the literature into this new setting that we call the EcoTS setting. So we have asked multiple questions. So the first one is how to deal, what should be the form of the, of the classifiers so that we had in ECTS. So how training sets should be constructed in this new setting where open time series are actually labeled by experts in different regions of the same one. And most importantly, how to solve uh, online the accuracy earliness trade-off in this new setting. So I'm going to draw a parallel in terms of classifiers in those two settings. So the first one is the CTS setting. So we used to have classifiers for each timestamp. They're all having, like, they have different inputs because each classifier has a part of the time series. And they all, they all have uh, uh, the same output, which is the predicted class label of the complete time series from a partially observed one. And here there's an assumption that, we, that is made in the literature of the problem, which is that the more data we have, the more, the accuracy, the more accuracy of the classifier uh, increases, increases. So here, for example, H5, we suppose that he has uh, more predictive accuracy than, than H1, because it has uh, certainly more data and more patterns. So actually, we want to translate this assumption into this new setting that we call EcoTS for which we have actually classifiers now for each for different horizons. So all the classifiers now have the same input, which is a 
an observation sliding window. And the classifiers actually try to predict the class level of points in time that are different. So here, for example, H2, which is a positive horizon classifier, will predict the class label of a point in the future that we haven't received yet. And uh, H0, the first point of the sliding window, and when we have negative horizon, it means that we're trying to predict the class label of a point already uh, existing in our sliding window. So here, the translation of the assumption that we had is that the, the closer we get, the closer our sliding window gets to the target point, which is in red, uh, the more accuracy we have, because it's because we suppose that, for example, we could have some early signs on the data that announces the uh, the class label of this of this point. So here, we're going to see in details uh, later this uh, this experience accuracy trade-off. So the second thing is how actually to learn what is the procedure actually to learn those classifiers with different horizons. So in our training data set, we're going to choose. Uh, randomly some targets, and around those targets, we're gonna. Sorry, around those targets, we're gonna uh, um, extract some sliding windows around a given target, and each of these sliding windows will actually serve as a training example to an, an associated classifier. So the first, uh, the first sliding window will serve as a training example for the classifier H2 because it is two points before the target. And actually the same logic goes for the rest of the classifiers. So those targets will be chosen uh, uh, randomly on the open time series. We make sure that there is no uh, uh, overlapping between the, the windows. And we're going to choose multiple targets and the result is that we have multiple training data sets to train each of the of our classifier and for each horizon. So now the question is how to solve uh, the earliness accuracy trade-off in this setting. So uh, here let's suppose that we have a fixed target in the future. So let's say for example tomorrow at 2 p.m. and we have now our sliding window, uh, sliding window as our current time step. So here, as time goes, our sliding window will get uh, closer to the target. And actually, what we suppose is that the closer our sliding window gets to the target, the easier the, class of the task of the classification. So here, as you can see, the accuracy, as we get closer to the target, the accuracy increases and the earliness decreases. So here, we need to deal actually with uh, the earliness accuracy trade-off, and we need to uh, actually answer the question, uh, what is the optimal horizon to use uh, in order to, to predict the class label of this target? So this is what we're going to see. So by answering the three questions, we have a, a methodology actually to adapt the ACTS approaches into this new setting. And we actually applied it on two approaches of the state of the art. So economy gamma that we proposed in section two, and also another approach uh, uh, called SR from the literature. And here we're going to see the scenario for the uh, economy gamma approach. So at uh, a timestamp T, we have our sliding window X, and we have a fixed target in the future. So the economy uh, gamma uh, will actually try to estimate the cost of decision for every for every horizon. So we used to do it for every future time step. Now we need to do it for every horizon, so from positive horizon to negative horizons. And then we're going to see actually where is the minimum. So here in this case, it doesn't coincide with the target. So in, we need this minimum to coincide with the target in order to, for the trigger model to decide to classify this point. So here, the decision would be to get new measurements. And our sliding window will get closer. We re-estimate the costs of decisions for every horizon. And, um, and actually, the minimum does not coincide with the target. We're going to see new measurements. And now, the minimum coincides with target. And actually, the decision it means that there is no better trade-off in the future, and now we need to, to decide to, to classify the target point. 
So the same, actually, the same logic goes for the SR approach that we adapted from the ECTS literature. We use the same classifiers and the same methodology in order to deal with the, the earliness accuracy trade-off in this new setting. So as you can see, we don't have a deadline here. And we can do this multiple targets. So here I show the example of a single, of a single target. But actually, more targets are treated in the same, in the same way uh, in parallel. So for the experiments, we validated this approach on a real data set publicly available. In, and it is from one of the Ashwan factories, which is a frozen food industry corporation, uh, where we have 100 multivariate open time series that are associated with 100 machines over, period, over one year of period. And we have actually labels for the points where the machines actually had some problems, failures. So the features include pressure, rotation, voltage, and other, other stuff. For the evaluation criterion here, we actually, since decisions actually are made independently from time step to time step, we're going to do actually the same for the evaluation criterion. So for a given time series in our evaluation sets, we're going to actually, uh, we have capital N as the length of this time series, and we're going to evaluate point by point. Um, so for each point, our trigger model gives us the optimal horizon to predict its class. So we're going to use this class with, the, with this, sorry, this optimal horizon uh, with the associated classifier to predict the class of this point. And we're going to compute the cost of misclassification. And also we have, um, we're going to compute the cost of delay in order to have the average, the average cost that we, the user pay for this, uh, for this time series. So we have compared multiple approaches. We have the, the baseline approaches, we are, which are the late baseline and the early baseline. So these baselines don't actually uh, adapt the horizon according to the data. So the late baseline always uses the latest classifier to classify the points. And the early baseline always uses the early, uh, the early classifier in order to predict the, the class labels. We have also methods adapted from the ACTS literature uh, using our proposed methodology. So we have the economy gamma approach that proposed in section two, and we have the SR approach, uh, which stands for stop in a row, but we also adapted using the same methodology. And we have uh, proposed a very simple approach uh, called, that we call uh, CC, consecutive classifiers, which is, a base, which is based on a threshold that whenever actually we take classifiers from the earliest one to the, to the latest one, and whenever the probability of belonging to class one exceeds a certain threshold, we trigger the alarm to classify this point. So this thre threshold uh, is optimized uh, according to our evaluation criterion. So for the results, we have here the average cost, which is our evaluation criterion. On the x-axis, we have the values of the delay cost. And we see that when the cost of delay is very high, so the optimal strategy is the early baseline, as expected. When the cost of delay is very low, taking, uh, using the latest baseline is a good strategy, but not the optimal one. And we see that the CC approach actually switches, as expected, from the latest baseline to uh, the earliest baseline as the cost of delay increases. And most importantly, we see that uh, adapted approaches from the ECTS using our methodology outperforms the other, the other approaches, and especially the, the threshold-based approach. So for, we have also investigated uh, uh, the distribution of decision moments of the, of the both of economic gamma and SR approach. And we see on this figure on the x-axis the horizons that were used uh, to make predictions. So on the left, we see very late decisions, which are negative horizons, and very early decisions on the right associated with positive horizons. And first thing, we see that uh, 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 the economic gamma approach and the SR are, are capable of uh, choosing a suitable horizon for their decision according to the data and the delay costs. And especially, they are um, able to uh, to adapt their decision according to the delay cost. So on the top figure, we see a low delay cost. On the bottom figure, we see uh, a high delay cost. So the, what we see here is that, for example, the SR approach um, 
actually uh, shifts its uh, distribution towards very early and positive horizons as the delay cost increases, which is expected because we pay more if we wait. And also we see the same behavior on economy level. We also see that the SR approach in order to adapt this decision in this case. And yeah. So now uh, for the conclusion, I will conclude with some uh, future research direction that we think uh, that we propose for the scientific community as a position paper. So here we have seen the SETS problem where the decision is associated with the complete time series. Then in, uh, in the last section, I presented the, the ECOTS setting, which is a bit different, where decisions are made timestamp by timestamp. And here, what uh, we propose is the MLEDM uh, problem, which is a machine learning based early decision making, where we have actually the same uh, training data set as ECOTS setting, but actually at training time, we want decisions actually to be located in time. So here we want decisions not on a specific point, but on intervals. So we want, for example, uh, to predict a class label for a certain interval of time. And actually this comes with a complexity that we need uh, to deal with in future work. So in the loss function, we see we have different costs to consider. So the first one is the cost of misclassification, uh, the cost of delay. So here we have on top the ground truth and the decisions made. So uh, for the delay cost, we need to actually take it into account from the beginning of uh, the decision of class one, for example, here. We need to take into account the time overlap costs. So as it will appear here, so here we've made decisions of class one, for example, and we need, uh, and those decisions actually do not overlap perfectly with the right decisions or the ground truth. So we need to take into account this cost of, of, uh, of non-overlapping. And finally, we could miss some decisions and we need to take that into account. So for, for here, we have made a decision specific to, to class one at the beginning, and we have an extra decision at the end uh, of cl with class one that did not exist in the ground truth. So in order to sum up the, sorry, in order to sum up the major contributions of the thesis, we have a extended a, a cost-based approach into a general framework economy for cost-based early classification of time series. And we proposed a novel method, economy gamma, and a cost-based uh, evaluation criterion. We also asked the question, what happens when decisions are revocable? And we tried to answer it uh, by proposing a novel method for that. And find, and we actually, uh, the third uh, contribution is we proposed a novel methodology to adapt the ACTS approaches into the ECOTS setting that we, um, that we, that I presented in the last section. And finally, we took a step back in order actually to, to think about what could be the promising research direction that we could uh, uh, work on in the future. So we attempted a redefinition of the ACTS problem as the ML EDM problem, and we op proposed 10 open, open problems to the scientific community. So those 10 open problems, we have dealt with some of them that I marked in, that I mentioned in orange. There are some others that we couldn't deal with so that we propose them to the scientific community for future work so i'm i don't have enough time so i am just going to list them so the first one is extending the non-myopic feature for the unsupervised approaches the second one is addressing actually other supervised learning tasks could be regression or forecasting and uh, the third one is early weekly supervised learning the seventh one is how do, do we manage the the non-stationarity in NL EDM, and finally, how what happens actually when costs are time dependent. So, thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to answer uh, the questions of the members.